I first met cosmologist and author Dr. Jude Curravan in 2007 after my mentor Hamish Miller introduced us. Hamish had been impressed with Jude's ability to present complex scientific ideas in ways that were relatively easy to understand, as well as her willingness to accept the gifts presented to her by her intuitive inner universe. Although Jude and I didn't work together at that time, it was very apparent that she would become a prominent figure in any future changes that Gaia needed us as a species to consider. Today, she's not only an author of six, soon to be seven, non-fiction books about the fundamental nature of reality, but she's also a key figure in expressing the new paradigm of our unified reality worldwide. Working with other major change leaders, she communicates clearly how adopting the new science could elicit transformational healing in the world, on both an individual and global scale. The change of perspective that we need to adopt through this new science really is that significant. In this conversation, we highlight some of the major developments in the scientific thinking that reveals the fundamental nature of the human being as embodied consciousness in a holographic conscious cosmos. We look at how and why we are each capable of playing our part in the radical change that we're currently experiencing as part of the background to our lives. And believe it or not, dousing and your intuition have a huge part to play in all of this change. Stick with us and you'll learn why repeating patterns of cosmic information at different scales could be either our salvation or our downfall. But throughout all of this discussion, there remains an underlying message of hope and I trust you'll be able to see that for yourselves. It was inspiring to reconnect with Jude after 15 years, so sit back, Pull up a cup of your favourite brew and enjoy this first part of Jude's sometimes mind-blowing cosmic picture. And let me know what you think in the comments below. Um, you describe yourself as a cosmologist, planetary healer, futurist and author. That's taken from a recent presentation that you did for IONS. Which of those do you feel, which of those headings do you feel best represents you these days? Well, one of the things I would say is that they all interweave. So it's like trying to pull apart a sort of a, a tapestry or a river to find all the tributaries that go into it in that sense. But I suppose at the deepest sense, it's cosmologist, because for me, a definition, my definition of, of, of being a cosmologist is that I'm curious about the nature of reality itself and not just what we call our physical universe, which is what most cosmologists look at or consider when they they do their work but but you know the the whole cosmos in all of its as i've experienced it and, and researched it all its conscious multi-dimensionality so it's that curiosity about the deepest understanding and, and nature of reality that that i can uh, perceive and then share that with others. So I suppose cosmologist is the is is the is the biggest umbrella, as it were, because it in, includes all the others. Indeed, and and in fact, what you're talking about there is is going right from, as you say, the physical cosmos, and that's beyond our known universe into all of the extent that we believe is out there, but also going in to our own inner existence as well. Presumably, tell us a little bit about that and your experience on that side of things. Very much. And, and what I my work's about really is, is hopefully helping to integrate those because we're very good at dualities. We're very good at, you know, uh, considering the apparent separation of the world. But as, as you know, spiritual teachers have told us, indigenous wisdom keepers tell us, universal wisdom teachings, you know, go on about for millennia you know, separation itself is an illusion. Uh, reality is real, but separation is an illusion. So even that, when we talk about inner, outer, when we talk about, you know, body, mind, spirit, when we talk about, you know, the multidimensionalities of, of, of the world, um, really, ultimately, we are 
part of a, a, a unified cosmos, playing itself out, adventuring itself in many, many different levels of perception and experience and exploration and evolution. Um, and therefore, what you know, I I share and serve is is that is that inter interweaving of all those aspects, um, where instead of separation, there is differentiation, and diversity, um, and in ultimate integration. So on a day to day level, because I, I think it's really useful. Well, I, I tend to try to bring things down to a very practical level where, you know, I know a lot of my subscribers, uh, they love the concepts and, and what you've just described is a fantastic concept. And, and, you know, it's about that celebration of the unique individual uh, bringing that down to a day to day level. How does somebody sort of uh, how do you feel that you express that picture that you've just described? In, in your life, in the way that you relate to people, in the way that you relate to nature, perhaps? Yeah. Well, many, many years ago, when I was doing some field walk, what was called field walking, as part of my uh, PhD in archaeology, which involves a lot of walking, a lot of bending, and trying to find flints and various other bits and pieces on the ground. But I was in a beautiful field nearby where I live, uh, near Avebury, on a gorgeous summer morning. And I was on my own. The other volunteers hadn't yet arrived. And literally, I heard the words out of a blue sky. It basically was saying, is in our ordinariness as human beings, we're actually all extraordinary. And in the extraordinariness of our divinity, we're all ordinary. It was that melding of the extraordinary and the ordinary, you know, in our everyday lives. Because I agree with you. I think otherwise, these, these wonderful concepts... And yet for me, it's always been about how do we then expand our awareness to embrace this wondrous wholeness and multidimensionality of consciousness and then bring it through our everyday lives? You know, how does it serve and support and nurture and inspire and empower us when we're down the supermarket or doing the washing up or whatever, or in the middle of a challenging situation? Because I think that's when it really really benefits us to have this sense of wholeness. You know, when we're in a situation where the appearance of separation, the challenges of those appearances really, um, really call us to move into that center, move into that sense of balance and wholeness and love. Because, you know, ultimately an interconnected cosmos is a cosmos that is founded on love, on relationship. And in that uh, exploration of that concept of love and, and that compassionate relationship, that view of self, in a way, we see the universe exploring and uh, processing different aspects all the time which I suppose you as a cosmologist would say is part of the informational field. Would that be a correct kind of leap from one aspect to another? <laughs> it's a great leap. Yes. I mean, my work is, is coming based on scientific evidence, you know, at all scales of existence and across many, many different fields of research, together with experiential investigation together you know with with bringing all the threads we talked about the threads of of my own sense of self bring all those threads together and what's being revealed is a universe where mind and consciousness aren't something we have but literally what we and the whole world are so if you see that sense of cosmic consciousness underpinning all the appearance of our universe which cosmologically and at every scales we now understand exists and evolves as a non-locally unified entity, then what this does is it brings back meaning and purpose, not just into our existence, but into the existence of the entire universe. Because what we also know is that it began an incredibly fine-tuned and ordered state. So, you know, we talk of a big bang, but that in is implicitly chaotic, whereas we now understand that our universe began in that incredibly ordered 
exquisitely fine-tuned state more as the first moment of an ongoing big breath. So, you know, what this is doing now, this whole worldview that I write about in The Cosmic Hologram and my forthcoming book, The Story of Gaia, is based on cosmic consciousness expressing itself, articulating itself in a language of meaningful information. So just as our English language has 26 letters, our digitized technologies have two, ones and zeros. Our universe, far more foundationally than our technologies, also expresses its consciousness and therefore our consciousness as meaningful information based on two universal letters, ones and zeros that come together just as our languages do in meaningful ways, in this case, as atoms and stars and planets and plants and people. Okay, so... Um... <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, if, it, if it's expressing itself as ones and zeros, are you saying that this is part that's a, that's a very digital expression as you said that, that that's the nature of our digital technology ones and zeros but surely what we 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 the universe is not a digital process it expresses itself in digital ways but that those digits are so are so minute they're as tiny in their pixelation to an atom is an atom is to the entire universe and, and we've got loads of evidence for this. So I'm not sort of going off on no. a, a tangent. We've got loads of evidence that the, that the reality, the appearance of our universe is pixelated at what's called the Planck scale, which is P-L-A-N-C-K. It's the most minute scale of, of, of all the fundamental measures in our universe uh, that are played out through the laws of physics. But what it means is that what we see as digitized actually when we look at it at the scale of quantum, the quantum scale, it can appear as a wave or a particle, depending on how we measure it. But if we distill down, 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 down to that minute level that is literally trillions on trillions of times smaller to an atom as an atom is to a universe, then just as when we look at a high definition image, we don't see the pixels, we see the, 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 the image. Right. It's, it's the same it's the same concept that at that tiny tiny level those two basic letters are able to be meaningfully accumulated at all scales from atoms to the you know within the entirety of our universe so so in this in this sense if if this is um this is sub this is way smaller than the overall quantum level of yeah. existence. So it's sub-quantum. So is that right? Yeah, it, it, it's almost helpful to go beyond the concept of quantum because what we understand now is that the, you know, the 20th century science of quantum physics and relativity, quantum physics describing the behavior of energy and matter and relativity theory describing the, the behavior as it were of, of space time, and in both cases, equivalenting them, so energy, matter, space, time, that appearance emerges from deeper levels of causation. And that those deeper levels of causation articulated as meaningful information express themselves in complementary ways as quantized energy, matter, and as non-quantized space time and and when we understand that and there's a there's a, another few steps to the rubik's cube that brings it all together but when we understand that and the other pieces that come into this framework and this underpinning literally everything fits together in a really beautiful and fundamentally simple way but it also crucially is based on not just the primacy of consciousness and mind but the all pervasiveness of consciousness and mind and the multidimensionality that enables um, you know what we call supernormal phenomena um, to, to be a natural part of, of our natural attributes as microcosms of this wonderful cosmic thought we call our universe 
I, lo I love some of the expressions that you use. And I also love the way that you work with words as well. Uh, your books are always an absolute uh, pleasure to read. I look forward to the next one and we'll have, if you've got time, we'll have to get you back nearer the time when it comes out and be published because I'm sure you'd love to discuss more about your, that book as it comes out. I, I just want to go back there a second. Uh, we, we've spoken on the channel, and my subscribers be aware that we've spoken to um, Amit Goswami, Dr. Amit Goswami. And he's, uh, he's wonderful with his, not only his, his, his need and the expression, the need to connect to the heart, but also the, 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 the concept of uh, infinite possibility from which reality is created moment by moment. So going back down to your sub-quantum uh, existence there that you were talking about. That, that I you... asked us not to call subquantum because it, it, it actually still denotes it as quantum. It's not. It's it's informational. It's this informational, um, you know, some people call it phase space, but it's this informational underpinning that actually from which the appearance of our universe arises. And it's only in energy matter that that appearance is quantized because space and time are not. Right. Okay. So, so as it comes up to uh, comes up to comes up to that level, like uh, I have to, okay, I have to kind of use this phrase of visualizing it like this, so it comes out yeah, of that great visualization level. So it's almost like a wave in itself coming up to that level, closer to that quantum aspect, which is when you start to get the formation of vortices as the the fundamental shape of. Absolutely. The universe i guess and that that is then what develops into formation of the atom the atomic structure of form and up again into and bigger and bigger and, until we get to the macro and then we go whoo right out into the the cosmic scales <laughs> that, that you mentioned right from the start absolutely so where are we in that in terms of what's what do you feel is our role as a species within that remarkable process of creation well um it's a fundamental question of course and it's a question that i continue to to both pose and respond to in my forthcoming book which is a story of gaia because what we're what we're understanding is that not only did our universe begin in that incredibly tiny uh, ordered fine-tuned state but it actually, the way that the relational laws of physics work and the whole setup has embodies an impulse, an evolutionary impulse to evolve. So it just doesn't exist and evolve as a unified entity. It exists to evolve from simplicity to ever greater levels of complexity, diversity, individuation, self-awareness, interdependence and so after 13.8 billion years here we are having this conversation <laughs> where we are we are children of our universe but we are also co-evolutionary partners with our universe potentially and our planetary home Gaia so our role is to embody as individuals as unique individuation of that vast intelligence, sentience, and evolutionary impulse of our entire universe and our planetary home, our experience and exploration of what it means to be part of this great adventure, but also perhaps now at this pivotal point to begin to wake up from a state almost of amnesia where we collectively sort of brought into this illusion of separation and all the you know all that's come from that and around the world now you know very much waking up to remember that we're inseparable we're still individuated but we're more differentiated we're never separate and so as microcosmic co-creators of our universe's meaning existential meaning and evolutionary purpose. That's where I feel we are at. And of course, that means we are multidimensional beings ourselves. And of course, it means as part of this great, and I'll use the word holographic, and we might come to that or not, this whole holographic perception of a universe that we have access 
naturally have access to its greater levels of sentience. Thank you. The uh, holographic nature, definitely. Um, let's just discuss that because it's become something of a, or it's becoming, shall we say, uh, more bandied about as, oh, well, you know, the universe is holographic. And it's like, well, okay, yeah, of course it is. Uh, but what does that mean? <laughs> what, what, what's your... <laughs> I, um, <laughs> How, how best and simply can you explain that sort of hol holographic principle that you, the, uh, as you uh, understand it from the science and your interpretation of it? Well, I love what you're saying just then, Tim, about everybody saying, yeah, of course it's holographic. Um, when I started talking about the holographic universe, um, probably 20 years ago, and then writing about it 10 years ago, it's like, what? What? <laughs> You probably remember those conversations. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah I do too. <laughs> so I just sort of sat alongside and, 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 and the evidence continued to, to accumulate. And, you know, we now have evidence, you know, from the smallest scales and we see it in the patterning of the universe because you mentioned, you know, we mentioned relationships and patterning and we find the same what are called fractal patterns relational fractal patterns, geometric patterns, playing up from the scale of atoms all the way up through our everyday lives, through our everyday collective behaviours, you know, through ecosystems and the internet, through coastlines and clouds, through the way that our, our solar system is in harmonic fractal relationship to galaxies and beyond and beyond and beyond. And in 2017, um, a group of researchers from five universities found that same fractal pattern in respect of tiny differences in temperature in what's called the cosmic microwave background. And this, the CMB, what this is, it's relic radiation left over from a very early epoch of our universe. And this radiation fills the whole of space. And what the analysis of, uh, of something called the W map uh, probe, a satellite probe showed, is those temperature differences that fill the whole of space are also fractal. So because fractal patterning is also indicative of holographic processes, that is a big clue. The other thing is that when we looked at what happens to a massive star, when it, at the end of its life, it runs out of its fuel and it collapses in on itself and its gravity is so powerful that it can't stop itself and it just continues to collapse to and, and through a, 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 an area, a sort of spherical area called the event horizon and it becomes a black hole. And we call it a black hole because not even light essentially can escape from it. So we have a spherical star that shrinks to a spherical event horizon and then continues to shrink without being able to be you know, measured beyond that because it, it's beyond that threshold of which we can measure. So the big question was, well, what happens to all the information of that star? And what we discovered is it's actually held on the event horizon. Now, that is an interesting moment of aha, because that, why would we think that all the information of a three-dimensional star would then be held when it collapses on a two-dimensional surface area. Because that's counterintuitive, because we think in 3D. Mm. So we'd expect that a larger star, a more massive star, with a bigger event horizon would have more information. In other words, the information held will be proportional to its 3D volume, but it isn't. It's proportional to its two-dimensional 2D surface. And that's what happens in a hologram. Oh, wow. Because what we do is we send a beam of light and we bounce it back off a subject, an object. It can be an apple, it can be Tim, it can be anybody. ABBA have just gone on a holo, you know, have a holographic yeah. presentation. We have, we have ABBA as holograms. How cool is that? 
Um, but, <laughs> but what we do is we collect them, that light bouncing back collects all the information of that surface, of that three-dimensional hologram. And when we do it, we can, we can literally plot all the 3D surface, you know, 3D appearance of the hologram. But what we do then is all that information is captured on a two-dimensional surface. When we then send another beam of light through that two-dimensional film, the 3D object is projected as a hologram. We can walk around it. There are, there are researchers now that are doing haptic holograms where you can actually touch it and it feels like the object. But the point is, when, when we were doing that with black holes, we were able to cosmologically extend that notion to the whole universe to show that the 3D appearance of our universe is projected from the two-dimensional boundary of what we call space-time. So we talk about three-dimensional space, four-dimensional space-time. We're now talking about two-dimensional space-time, one dimension of space, one dimension of time as the holographic boundary to what we call space, but literally then um, projects all the appearance of our universe. <laughs> I'm going to have to go and pick up my brain shortly because it isn't <laughs> in here anymore. Quite you know what this is, though? This is the science of love. Going back to Abbott, this is a science of love because it shows us that we are all not just interconnected. We are all ultimately one. And that unity of consciousness, which is based on this understanding, we've just come up, a group of folks uh, in what we call the evolutionary leader circle, we've come up with a unity of narrative that speaks to this, that underpins and frames and grounds us in this meaningful, purposeful universe and cosmos and our purpose and meaning and role in it. Mm -hmm.